Welcome one and all to the Storybox podcast, the place to be if you are a lover of stories. My name is Jay Fanson, former real estate agent, now living my purpose, sharing amazing stories from people all over the world. I'm grateful that you're here today. Now let's journey into the Storybox together and hear more about whose story will be unboxed today. Well, everyone, I am delighted to welcome the incredible, the most notable, legendary, motivational speaker, Les Brown. Les Brown is a, is a dynamic personality and highly sought after resource in business and professional circles for Fortune 500 companies, CEOs, small business owners. He is a best-selling author of multiple books. He's spoke to crowds of 80,000 people, motivating them, changing their life, myself included when I watched the, the video. You've got a new book out called You've Got to Be Hungry, The Greatest Within The Greatest Within to Win. Les, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Story Box today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I want to congratulate you for the great work you've been doing with Story Box to help people to change their story. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for bringing the light and your most motivation and inspiration. Thank you so much for saying that. that. That's a real honor to hear, especially coming from yourself. Les, I usually have one question that I love asking people to sort of start things off, and that is, what does success look like to you? Success to me is living a life that will outlive you mm. because you found your purpose. It was said that the most important day in our life, the day we were born and the day we realized why we were born. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we were born to make a difference. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we made some major contribution to humankind. And I believe that we should all live our lives in such a way that when we go, the world is better than how we showed up. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Where where did you come up with this? Your idea of success right now has it been sort of like this gradual thing over your life that you've realized it, or was there a catalyst moment somewhere? A catalytic moment was just being adopted and being a foster kid, and watching my mother, who never had any children herself but she decided to share her life with foster kids and then she eventually adopted us. I always say when I'm interviewed that I'm here because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. Mm. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And Abraham Lincoln said something that I borrow quite a lot. He said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. And I feel that same way. Wow. That's powerful, man. Like it really is. What I want to ask you, Les, is going back to how you were brought up and what you actually learned from your mother. What I want to ask you though is what did you see yourself being when you were younger? What did you actually want to be? Not much. (laughs) Because... When I was in the fifth grade, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I failed again when I was in the eighth grade. I have a twin brother. And, and, And so, but a turning point for me was when I was a junior in high school. I went in this class looking for a friend and the instructor, Mr. Leroy Washington, I can see him now. Young man, go in front of the room and read this and help us work this problem out. Mm-hmm. And I said, sir, I can't do that. And said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. And, and I said, I can't, sir. And the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? And they said, he's the dumb twin. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk. He looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. 
someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Whoa. How people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. And he interrupted my story of being the dumb twin. Mm -hmm. And when he spoke, when we communicate, when you have your program, you distract, dispute, and inspire. You distract people from their current story. And as they listen to you and your guests and the questions that you ask and the things that they share, you dismantle their current belief system and you inspire them to become, as Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God and mm -hmm. start writing a new chapter in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he did for me. What age were you when that happened? I was a junior in high school. Wow. And then moving from that, where did, where did you end up going? Like, did you go to college? Did you end up studying? I elsewhere? ended up going to the Miami Sanitation Department. A, a teacher made arrangements for me to get a job there as a garbage collector. Wow. And God will have it that one day I had to collect garbage on 56th Street where Mr. Washington lived. Mm. And I was so embarrassed. I carried the garbage container on my left side so he would not see me when I passed the window. And as I was going toward the truck, I heard his voice, Leslie Brown? Mm. And I kept walking. The other guy is saying, hey, this man calling you. Leslie Brown, I said, keep walking. Mm. And he came down off the porch and they, one of the guys tapped me on the shoulder and said, this man is calling you, Leslie Brown. Mm. And I emptied the, the garbage container and I said, yes, sir. He said, I thought that was you. Why didn't you come in? I said, sir, look at me. <laughs> I smell like garbage. I'm working on a garbage truck and, and we're in a hurry. We just can't stop and visit friends. And so he said, Edith, he called his wife, come get them some water. Would you guys like to have some water? I said, no, 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 we don't have time. They said, yeah, we got time. We can take a break. <laughs> And so it took a break. And finally, I knew the question was coming. What happened to you? I made it possible for you to go to Florida and M University on a speech and drama scholarship. First kid out of special education to get that. And I saw papers that you signed those papers to give that to somebody else. Why did you do that? I said, sir, I met with two of our teachers and counselors, and they said I was not college material and that you would not be there to save me, that I'm slow. I got a good job making $10 an hour for the Miami Sanitation Department, and I should hold on to that and be thankful. He said, Mr. Brown, he said, listen to me. Sometimes you have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. I know that it's a struggle for you and you're not as smart as your twin brother or your sister who goes to University of Miami, but you're a determined young man. You're a hungry man and you're a nice guy. He said, don't ever do that again. Sometimes you have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. And I said, thank you, sir. And when we pulled away, he just stood and watched me as we pulled away. And I, I couldn't sleep that night. That stayed with me. And I began to work on myself, to reinvent myself, to take on a different identity for myself. And that was in the area of radio. I wanted to be a broadcaster. And he told me, he said, you have to develop your communication skills because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. You mm -hmm. have to develop your mind because you don't get in life what you want. You get in life who you are. And you want to upgrade your relationships. Practice OQP, only quality people. Mm -hmm. And that will give you a durable, sustainable success in life. And he was right.
<laughs> I love that. I love that story. I don't think I've actually heard that story before. Um, and I've listened to you, you go on other podcasts and, and share so many other stories, but I don't think I've heard that one shared. Um, what I want to ask you, Les, working on yourself, like the power to actually believe in oneself, what are some of the things that you need to do in order for you to actually believe in yourself? Is it just a turn on thing? One day I believe in myself or is there something more to it than that? It's more to it than that. You have to really take the time to train your mind to serve you. Mm. We live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. We have not been educated. We have been indoctrinated. Mm. And so in order to overcome the, the negative programming, we have to, I think, give ourselves a ritual to read a minimum of 30 to 40 pages of something positive every day, first thing in the morning. Why? Whatever you read, whatever you hear, whatever you see, the first 20 minutes when you wake up, it will affect the spirit of your day. The next thing that's important, not only reading words that will expand your mind, but listening to motivational messages. I encourage people that are listening to go on YouTube and find Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome. And it's possible and getting unstuck. As you listen to these messages over and over again, reading 30 to 40 pages of something positive, write down some goals that you want to achieve and hopefully goals that's beyond your comfort zone. Why? Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone that you've never been. Mm. And by going through this process, you expand your vision. You get out of your head and start living from your imagination. Einstein said the imagination is the preview of what's to come. Most people, when they die, they die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65 because they have a limited vision of themselves. You can't fit a big dream into a small mindset. And you have to expand that mindset with the work that you do through reading, seminars, workshops, the experience you had in, in training yourself so that you can be able to do what you're now doing and make impact on millions of people's lives around the globe. Mm -hmm. It's a process mm -hmm. and it's an ongoing process. It never ends. I love that. I have a saying that I'm going to share with you, which basically relates to all that, which is be persistent to remain consistent. And if you want to do the work in terms of believing in oneself, you've got to, firstly, I believe you've got to be persistent at reading because if you're not persistent at reading, then you won't be consistent at it. Consistency is the flow on effect of being persistent. So if I really, really want something, if I truly want to believe in myself, I have to be persistent at it. I believe persistence is a key to all other aspects of your life. So if I'm persistent, then I will uh, practice more. I will, I will learn more. I will be, be better in life because I, I keep telling myself, and this is what I've, I've um, um, experienced in my own life, Les, is I've experienced the, the, the sheer power of when I'm persistent at getting something that I really, really want. And I believe, like I, I visualize it. I believe, like I visualize speaking to you today. I was persistent. I didn't stop. And it's not, I think that is, that is the most, one of the most important principles I can, I can share. I, I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you think about that? Persistence is very important. Calvin Cooley says, nothing is as powerful as persistence. Talent will not. Unsuccessful people with talent is almost a proverb. Education alone will not. The world is full of unsuccessful people who are very educated. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. He said that, that persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Og Mandino said in his book, The Greatest Salesman in the World, he said, say to yourself every day, I will persist until I succeed. Mm. 
<laughs> and and that's what I did. I embraced that. You're absolutely right. And most people are not persistent. You have to be persistent to go after your dreams because you're going to hit some roadblocks. Things are going to happen that you can't anticipate. When we get on a plane before they take off, they say, fasten your seatbelt. Why? <laughs> because you're going to experience some turbulence before you reach a comfortable altitude. That's the same thing in being in business. You are going to experience some setbacks, some rejections, and some failures. So you have to fasten your mental and psychological and spiritual seatbelt to brace yourself so that you can have the breakthrough that you're working on that will allow you to live a larger life. So you're absolutely right. Perfectly said. What I want to ask you, Les, is you are one of, I guess, the world's most notable and well-known motivational speakers. But what I'm always curious about is what does it take to become a motivational speaker? Well, I, I think that the path that I took is a pretty good one. I was interested in doing it, but mm -hmm. I realized I didn't know how to do it. And I told a friend of mine, and I said, man, I wish I could do that. And he said, Brownie, all of us are born the same way, dumb, naked, and speechless. <laughs> you can learn. Put your money where your mouth is. Mm. And I hired him as my strategist, as my coach. Mm. And sure enough, because I admired his speaking style, I'm encouraging them to find someone who's speaking on the level that they want to speak and that they admire, that they love their style. And I loved his style. And Mike Williams is his name. He wrote a book called The Road to Your Best Stuff. You'll be a great guest. I wrote the, the forward to it, The Road to Your Best Stuff. And so through that coaching, we looked at the speaking industry. And whatever you do, you have to make yourself set aside. Attention is the new currency, as you are aware. You have to be able to draw attention to yourself, you have to be able to hold the attention and direct the attention in this noisy place where we are. And so he said, the industry of speaking is based upon the Dale Carnegie course. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> and they give information from the Napoleon Hill book, Thinking Grow Rich. He said, Brownie, if information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. He said, advance with your stories. Stories represent a human being. It touches the heart. Advance with your story. And one final thing, don't let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. Conduct communications intelligence. Ask questions. Do your homework, find out who they are in their industry, what their mission is. And then you put together a presentation that will transform them individually and collectively with the experience that you create. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it could never be satisfied to going back to where it was. Mm. So true. What would you say, Les, has been the hardest thing that you've ever had to do in terms of your life or your career? I think the, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do was to go back on stage after I had fumbled. I choked. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, I admire a minister by the name of Dr. Charles Adams. He was selected among the top five speakers in the world, mm -hmm. ministers. And so my first workshop, he came to it. <laughs> so I said, you, 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 you're Dr. Charles Adams? He said, yes. And I had his speech that I admired transcribed. Oh. And I said, I've been admiring you for years. So guess what happened? He asked me to come to his church the next day. And I said, I'd be honored. So when I came to the church, they said, you Les Brown? I said, yes. Oh, great. Dr. Adams told us to receive you. 
and they took me down front and front row. So I'm all set to listen to him speak. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I went to a workshop yesterday and there's a young man who plans on being a national and global motivational speaker. And I'd like to invite him up right now to do the morning prayer. And Les Brown, would you please come up? I'm saying, what? And people started hunching me. Hey, he's calling you to come up. <laughs> I came up and people already, because he gave me a big build up. I bowed my head after I looked at 3,000 people. <laughs> I said, thank you, Lord, so much for this morning. Amen. And we just sat down. <laughs> people still had their eyes closed. And one man opened his eyes and said, the devil had his tongue. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so embarrassed. And the people next to me, they moved over because they figured I was a devil. <laughs> oh, my God. In the Baptist church, you know, they used the long prayers up in here. I didn't have one for them. That was the shortest prayer in the history of the church. And so that should be the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> so I sat in the parking lot and I looked in my rearview mirror and I said, this will never happen to me again. But it took some time mm. for me to get the courage to go back on stage because I choked. And I said, oh, am I going to be able to do it this time? Will my... Thoughts, can I hear them? Will they flow? Mm. And and they did, but it took me a long time to have the courage to go back on stage after humiliating myself. <laughs> that is a funny story. <laughs> yes, Lord, it wasn't funny then. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my abs are hurting. <laughs> is that funny? <laughs> I want to. I want to ask you. I don't know how I'm going to ask you this question, but um, that, that was too funny. But um, what does courage really mean, or, or how does someone actually get the courage to go back and 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 do that that thing that they failed at before? It is. It is the willingness to do it in spite of. Mm. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the willingness to act in spite of the fear. You have to confront it because it's a thought. And if you don't confront it, it will control you. And so you have to talk to yourself to mm. say, I can do this. I can do this. When I spoke in the Georgia Dome before 80,000 people, if people go online and see that, Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome, I had to say to myself, they had to come get me out of the men's room. I ran in there and locked the door. They said, you got to come out. I said, I can't hear the voices. <laughs> and my mentor said, come out, man. He said, they came to see you. You didn't come to see them. I said, Mike, I can't hear the voices. He said, Brownie, can you hear me? I said, yes. He said, come out and make your mother proud. I said, well, Mike, don't, don't use my mother on me. He said, yes, make your mother proud. They're going to videotape this. She's going to be so proud to see you speak to such a large audience. And I came out walking real slow. And we got halfway there. I said, I got to go to the bathroom again. They said, no, pee on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> No, he said, you got this. You got this. And I learned that sometimes you have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief mm. kicks in. Mm. <laughs> I'm going back to what you said before. So true. I love yeah. that, Les. I've got a few mm. more questions for you, Les, because I know our time's almost up. But um, this one is my legacy question that I love asking people towards the end. So you've been able to reach the age of 100 and your friends have put together a film for you of everything that Mr. Les Brown has said and everything you've done. Don't ask me how they got it all. We'll just call it magic, but they just did. 
and they've shown it to you on your 100th birthday, what do you want your film to say and to show about you? Les Brown, he aspired to inspire until he expired. He lived a life that will outlive him. Mm. That's it. That's perfect. I love that. This one, this question may be a hard one to answer, but we'll see how you go. If you could ask a question to anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Why? And what question would you ask them? Nelson Mandela. Mm. And my question to him, how did you in such a small quarter, and I was in South Africa and saw, saw where they kept him, how did you handle the feeling that the walls are closing in on you? When the thoughts creeped in your mind, maybe I should cooperate and do what they want me to do. What did you do after five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 26 years? How is it you didn't lose your mind? Mm. I would want to know that from him. It's a good question. Yes. And I would love to know the answer. <laughs> uh, Les, what would you say has been the worst piece of advice you've ever received from someone? I was having, <laughs> that's a very good question. I never get asked that. <laughs> Lunch with someone that I love very much and we were engaged. Mm -hmm. And she invited her girlfriend to come have lunch with us. And so when a girlfriend came, she says, hi, my name is Dr. Rosalind. And we were having lunch and she asked, what do you do? I said, well, I'm going to become a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to speak to major corporations, Fortune 500 companies. I'm going to travel and speak around the world. Like Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking and Zig Ziglar, See You at the Top, mm -hmm. and Foreign Countries. And she said, what's, what's your qualification? I said, what do you mean? Where, where are your credentials? What college have you attended? I said, I have not attended any college. I, in fact, when I was in fifth grade, I was labeled educable mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I fell again in the eighth grade. And I'm going to share that. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to give me an advantage. Mm -hmm. She said, Mildred, she said, can we go to the restroom for a moment? And she said, yes. So they went to the restroom and my girlfriend, Mildred, and they came back. Her eyes were red. She was obviously had been crying. And so Rosalind said, Dr. Rosalind, I'll see you, Mr. Motivator. So I said, why were you crying? She says, Les, Rosalind is a psychiatrist. And she said that you're suffering from delusions of grandeur. I said, is that a good thing? She said, hell no. <laughs> she said, you're out of your mind. You don't have a college education. You were labeled educable, mentally retarded. How can you compete with people with PhDs and MBAs? Our engagement is off. I said, no. Yeah, she said, I'm, I'm unevenly yoking myself. Wow. That was a defining moment. She said, you should quit this now and go get a job. And she got up and she left me in the restaurant. And six weeks later, to make a long story short, I culminated a speaking engagement at a place called the Church of Today. And God will have it that Roger King of King World mm. was in a hotel and saw me speaking on the news about the crowd that showed up. He called me the next day and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to do a, a show with you. To make a long story short, mm. he sent me three days later a check for $2.5 million 
Whoa. I invited her to come down to the Renaissance Hotel. <laughs> when the limousine picked her up and brought her there, I had rose petals sprinkled in front of her. And when she came up on the top floor, this is a revolving restaurant. She said, whoa, and the meal started at $200. And, and so she sat down and she said, whoa, things are looking real good for you, aren't they? I said, yes. She said, what happened? And I gave her a copy of the check of $2.5 million. And God is my witness. She dropped down her knees on her knees and said, will you marry me now? I said, oh, please, don't represent yourself in such a way. I'm oh. suffering from delusions of grandeur. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the ultimate comeback. Oh, that is so good. Yes. Oh, my God, yes. Oh. I love that, Les. I know we've run out of time, but I do want to give you an opportunity to talk about your, your latest book, You've Got to Be Hungry. Where can people buy that book? Why, why should they buy it? And where can people connect with you? It will change their lives. It will change their lives. It will stir up the hunger in them. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. It will create a drive in them. It will access their greatness and, and inspire and motivate them. If they go to I am hungry, lesbrown.com. Mm -hmm. I am hungry, lesbrown.com. They can order the book. But in addition to that, those who are listening and are now coach trainers and speakers on how to tell their story. And if they want one-on-one -on -one coaching, I work with a limited number of people. They can email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com. LesBrown77 at gmail.com. I believe that we need more messengers of hope. Evil prevails when good men and women do nothing. And I believe now more than ever, there's a vacuum. And my goal is to train them how to use their story to distract, dispute, and inspire to transform audiences individually and collectively, adults as well as young people, and expand their vision of themselves that their dream is possible and it's necessary and it's them. That's my dream is to inspire as many people as I possibly can. My goal is to reach every single person on the face of this earth to make them realize that they are worth something, that they are meaningful. And because of you today, Les, I'm that one step further to accomplishing that goal. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story today, for being a bit vulnerable, making me laugh a lot <laughs> as well. Your, your smile is contagious. Your energy is infectious. Thank you so much, Mr. Les Brown, for coming on the Storybox podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you and the great work that you're doing. <laughs>